I uh, forgot to wear my red, but Scott Moore's wearing enough red for me, too, <laughs> so I'm grateful for that. And Hudson as well. Thank you, Hudson. It is good to be with you on this Lord's Day. I'd like to invite you to worship. Come, let us worship the Lord. Please stand and join us as we sing.
Beverly Heights early morning worship. We are glad to see you and we're glad to have you join us in worship. Would you take a moment, turn to your uh, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, tell them, tell them you're glad to be worshiping with them. Amy Lucas to bring us our morning announcements. Good morning, church. <coughs> welcome to Beverly Heights Church. We're so happy that you're here with us this morning. And a special welcome if you're visiting with us. We're so glad that you're here, that you've joined us this morning. We'd love for you to let us know you're here. You can use the visitor card in the pew and drop that in the offering plate just to let us know that you are with us this morning. And we're, um, again, so happy that you're here. I do have a few things I'd like to bring to your attention. First of all, um, our middle school and high school students are invited to come to the church this evening for a Super Bowl party. They'll be gathering at 6 o'clock. Uh, boys can bring drinks and girls can bring snacks or desserts and they'll have pizza and I think macaroni and cheese. They're going to have a, a really fun time together this evening. That's at 6 o'clock. I have a few uh, uh, women's Bible studies I'd like to bring to your attention if in case you are looking for a place to plug in. I uh, wanted to let you know that there's a Tuesday morning Bible study that meets at 9.30. They've been meeting since September, but they have plenty of room and they'd love for others to join them. So if you're looking for a spot to plug in, Tuesday mornings at 9.30, Sarah Reed is leading a study called Becoming a Woman Whose God is Enough. And um, if you have more, you would like more information about that, you can see myself or uh, Sarah Reed and we can get you the information you would need. But again, that's it's Tuesday mornings at 9.30. And then beginning in March, we have a study beginning that Katie Parrish is going to be leading. There is information in Gathered Seeds about it, so you can read more about it. But it is called the Wellness Revelation, and it is a nine-week study to physical and spiritual wellness. And so if you're interested in looking into that, that's going to be meeting on Monday evenings at 7 o'clock. There'll be a movement component and a study component, and so in time for discussion. So if you're interested, uh, information about that is in Gathered Seeds. As, again, you can pick up Gathered Seeds at the back entrances or in the hallway right behind me next to the water fountain. And then Wednesday Night Heights, I wanted to bring up again to make sure you all know, everyone is invited to join us for dinner on Wednesdays. We had a huge turnout this past week, what, almost 150 people, um, and we are enjoying time together table fellowship, growing together as the body of Christ. Um, children are invited to come at four, for, uh, starting at age, at age four, um, all the way up to 12th grade. At four o'clock, you can come for a snack, and there's programming all the way until 545, and then we have dinner together, and then at seven o'clock, Rick Wooling um, is continuing his Bible study on the book of Exodus. Thank you. If you would, please direct your attention to the screen and join me in our responsive call to worship this morning. I invite you to stand. <clears throat> o Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with, glo with glory and honor. Let us pray. Gracious God, loving Heavenly Father, you have indeed called us out of darkness and into your glorious light. 
We who were once lost and not a people, you have declared to be God's people, a people for your own so that we might proclaim the goodness of God. So as we come into your presence this morning, we ask, Lord, that you would pour a special anointing upon this place and upon your people and upon this holy work of worship. We pray for your spirit's power and enablement for your church as we seek to glorify the anointed one. Come, Father, inhabit the praises of your people. Come and be lifted up above all else so that the world may see and that the world may believe. Draw near to us even now as we draw near to you. We pray this all in Jesus' name, who is above all other names. And all God's people said, amen. attention this morning to a New Testament reading found in Paul's first epistle to the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And here, uh, Paul, in this portion of the letter, 
discusses the work that uh, he has been doing, the work that the apostolic ministry has been doing in building the church. And it seems appropriate for us to consider these words as we focus on bringing work back to the church. That's uh, our, uh, as our sermon series has been considering the things that God is bringing back and recentering in the church. This morning we'll be looking at work, and Paul has some things to say. He says, but I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day of the Lord will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with the words of the apostle and the apostolic witness in our ears and now in our minds and in our hearts. We hear the love that Paul has for the church, which is giving voice to the love, Lord, that you have for the church. We hear of Paul's devotion and spending his life with purpose and seeing the church built up draws our attention to the foundation upon which our work is laid. And that foundation is Jesus. And so we come to you this morning, Lord, and we give you thanks that you would establish us with such strength, stability, that you would give us the Lord Jesus Christ as the foundation upon which our lives are built. We also hear of the work that Paul is doing and the work that you have commissioned us to do. You've called us to build, that we are a builder because you are a builder. And you've called us to labor well, and to build things with uh, precious metals, to build precious things with precious material. And so, Lord, it's a measure of stewardship that you've called us to in our lives, to evaluate the things that you've given to us and to take the choicest gold, the silver, the precious stones, to see them firmly established and built into that which you designed. So often, Lord, we take up the wood, the hay, the stubble, the straw, and it will not preserve and will not persevere. And a fire is coming. A fire is coming that will test our lives and test that which has been built. And it will reveal. It will, re- it will reveal our stewardship. It will reveal our labor and our efforts. 
And Lord, I pray that that revelation would be profound and would profoundly give you praise and glory as we, your church, have laid up treasures in heaven as we, your church, have built with the precious things that you've entrusted to us in order that your church might be strong, in order that your church might be glorious, in order that your church might be winsome and attractive to the surrounding culture and to the surrounding world. Help us, Lord, to build in such a way so as to be a blessing. A blessing to those who are far off. A blessing to those who are lost. A blessing to those who are in need. Help us to build, Lord. Help us to build in keeping with your great design. Build our lives, Lord, by grace. Continue to mold us and to shape us and to form us. Fashion us. Not only us, but our children as well. And our grandchildren. So that future generations might enjoy the strength of that foundation and the good work that was built up in order that they might receive it as an inheritance and to continue the work into the future. And that for generations to come, that this place, even Mount Lebanon, even Upper St. Clair, even Bethel Park, Scott Township, the South Hills, might enjoy a blessing and healing Because you have built well and we have built well here at Beverly Heights Church. So we give ourselves to you anew, Lord. We pray, Lord, that we would be found as good stewards, good laborers, good workers for your kingdom and for your praise and your glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Well, this time I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward as we continue to worship now through the giving of our tithes and our offerings.
gracious God, loving Heavenly Father, you are indeed our vision. You have opened our eyes of faith, attuned our ears of understanding. Indeed, we have seen the Lord, and we have beheld his power and his glory. Oh God, be our first love, be our all in all. May we offer unto you our undivided love and attention and our utmost devotion. May we behold you all the days of our lives. May we discern your Holy Spirit. May we lay down our life as you lay down yours. Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise for this time of worship, for these gifts. We ask, Lord, that uh, you take these gifts and that they would serve your purposes and that your name would be glorified in this church. And all God's people said, amen. I'd like to invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 5 as we focus our attention this morning on God's Word. As we continue this series, That Holy City, and looking at a number of topics, a number of categories that God is uh, returning to the church, recentering the church. The church is that holy city that is uh, revealed to us in Scripture throughout Scripture, but uh, most uh, perceptibly, most beautifully in the book of Revelation, 21st and 22nd chapter, a revelation of the church that is to come and the church that is now. And there is this river that flows and brings things to the city, and it brings with it uh, not only the health and the strength and the uh, glory and the wealth of the kingdom of God, but it brings with it the nations The nations will return and bring the wealth of the nations back to the church in order that the world might enjoy God's blessing. And so this morning we're looking at the theme or the topic of work, work that has been lost, work that has been misunderstood, misconstrued by the world and the necessity for the church to recapture an understanding, a biblical or theological understanding of work. And so we direct our attention to Exodus chapter 5, where we find the people of God at work. They are working, uh, Israel is working, uh, and they are building, and they are building in a particular way and in a particular place, but it's not uh, entirely what God had in mind. And so uh, God sent uh, his servant Moses to address Pharaoh and to address the situation in order to recover the work of God's people and to direct it in the place that God had intended. And so, uh, again, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to invite you to open to Exodus chapter 5 or to take a pew Bible. I'd like to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. 
But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. <coughs> Excuse me. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they, make, that, that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labor at it and, and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves, wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, and when there's, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foreman of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them, as they came out from Pharaoh, and they said to them, The Lord look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and you have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. And you have not delivered your people at all. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your word. Grateful for this well-known account. This history of the people of God, which we have shared in your church for generations, all the way back to the people of God enslaved in Israel. We tell it to our children. And it can become familiar. And the importance and the meaning of it can become lost. Lord, I pray that you would revive this word to us today. Revive the teaching of your scriptures upon us and upon our hearts and upon our minds. Bless us, Lord, that we might learn, that we might grow, that we might be your workers. For your praise and your glory, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. I've shared with you in the past that I had a mixed experience uh, growing up in the church. And that in my latter high school years, in the early part of my college years, I, I wasn't going to Sunday morning worship, which I am ashamed of uh, as an adult. Uh, and because of that experience, I've uh, grown in my adult years uh, to have a very strong conception of the church and the necessity to live life in and through the church, having had a significant gap in my own life. But uh, during those uh, two years of high school, I did attend... Uh, a youth group, Northway Community, Christian Community Church. I speak a little bit about that in the latest Gathered Seeds uh, newsletter. You can read about that, one of those stories uh, in that newsletter. But the year after my graduation, I spent a year at uh, 
Butler County Community College, what we called BC3. And uh, while that was happening, I was uh, too old and really becoming disinterested in continuing on in high school ministry as a, as a youth group attender. And so uh, some friends of mine, we were in a common peer group, we began to um, pursue and engage in other local ministries that were focused on young adults, young adults and uh, college uh, students. And uh, there was one uh, such event uh, in which I participated with my friends, and uh, we were visiting. We were newcomers, and the day that we came, there was uh, an opportunity for the group to give testimonies. Now, I have kind of a, a tortured uh, experience, a tortured uh, perspective on testimony. I think that there can be great value in testimony if the testimony that is being offered gives glory to God, at which point the testimony uh, of God's work and faithfulness is of great benefit to the kingdom and, and glorifying to God. When the testimony is really about me, then the testimony goes south. It gets sour. It's, it's not what a testimony is supposed to be about. And I had um, some concerns when I heard that we would be giving testimonies. The, the prompt that the leader offered was to ask the question, how has God been working in your life? Which is actually a pretty good question. How has God been working in your life? And I remember a number of folks uh, began to give testimony as to how God had been working in their life. But there was one testimony in particular that I remember clearly from that uh, event, from that uh, one time that I visited this college group. There was a young man, <coughs> excuse me, and I remember him distinctly. I remember him that he was, he was not an American, he was an international. I I think he was Pakistani, if I recall. He had a very thick accent, and he was studying here in the U.S. He reminds me of uh, the type of profile or person of a young man whom I've met many, many times through my engagement with PRISM, Pittsburgh Region International Student Ministries, particularly during the garage giveaway if I, as I've piled them into the truck and I've helped to uh, move uh, furniture for them and have conversations with them. There's this thick accent, and you, you have a good conversation, but you must really strain hard to understand what it is that's being said. Well, I remember what this young man said, and I remember hearing it clearly. He believed, and he was a Christian at the time. He had come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was giving testimony of God's goodness, and he believed that God was calling him to do a mission which I thought was rather interesting. Someone who had worked so hard to come to the United States was preparing to leave the United States and to go and to serve in other parts of the world, less prosperous, less clean, less healthy, uh, just altogether different than the United States. But this young man had come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and felt a burden from the Lord that he was being called to uh, par participate in an overseas mission during the summer. And he needed to raise money for his trip. Now, the thing that makes this uh, interesting is that he had come here as an international and he had no networks. He didn't have resources. He didn't have networks of people that he could go to and say, I'm going on an international missions trip. I need to raise two, $3,000. Would you sponsor me? Would you support me? He had no networks of support, but nevertheless, he believed that God had called him to go on mission. And so I remember him sharing some of the, the troubles that he was having and raising the money, but then he gave the most amazing testimony. He said, I want to thank God that he has heard my prayers, for he has given me more hours at work. He was working at a small international grocery store and he was going to school full time but the manager of the store had said if you want to work more hours we can give you more hours to work and he said yes I'd love to take more hours to work because I'm raising money to go on a missions trip and I remember him sharing that testimony and thinking that is crazy that's, I've never heard anybody thank God for giving them more work. I want to thank God 
for giving me more hours. I want to thank God for giving me more work. My friend group, we afterwards went to Denny's or wherever it is we would typically go and debriefed. And I remember someone mentioning how unexpected, even jarring it was to hear this young man give this testimony. We all agreed that we, we would have desired, if we were in his position, we would have desired that our testimony had been Somebody gave me the money, and now I can go on this mission trip. But his testimony was, God gave me more hours so that I could work. And therefore pay for this ministry that God has called me on. I'll never forget that testimony. So counter. So countercultural, counter to our expectations, even as Christians. Why didn't God just show up with the money? He showed up with ours. We have to bring work back to the church. It strikes us as odd. It strikes us as foreign. It strikes us as unusual because we've lost a conception of work. In the church, we must bring work back to the church. We must recognize that work is a part of God's wealth. It is a part of God's strength. It is a part of God's uh, program of blessing for the nations that he would call and cause the church to work. And to work in a particular way. And to work hard. Over the last number of weeks, we've been looking at worship, we've been looking at mission, education, sexuality, and today we are looking at work. We must bring work back to the church. We need to bring work back to the church. We need to recover a biblical understanding of work. We need to recover a theological definition of work. We need to remember biblically and theologically what work is and what it is for. For far too long we've allowed the culture, we've allowed the city of man to define work for us and to define work for the world, for the Christian. We've allowed the world to set the agenda the nature and the purpose of work. For what will the world say? How does the world define work? There's a multiplicity of ways, but let me suggest to you a couple of summary statements, a couple of summary ideas about what work is, how the world defines work. One way in which the world uh, the world defines work is to say this, those who Occupy the city of man will say to us, well, work is evil. Work is a problem. It's an enemy to be defeated. Now, this is in part due to a lingering theological or even cosmological misconception. A misconception biblically and theologically way back in the history that has found its way into the culture. It's seeped into the culture and has permeated and has been allowed to replicate and continue on even to this present day. It's a misconception of the cosmos, an understanding of how God has wired up the world. And our culture will say, work is a problem. Work is evil. There's this bad theology that's underneath the ground, underneath the hood, way back in the history that says, well, work is really a result of the fall. God made this Garden of Eden, uh, Eden, and Garden of Eden, you might say. There was a pizza shop, Garden of Eden. That's right, Bob knows about it. Back in Imperial, the Garden of Eden. It's a pretty good pizza shop. God made this garden. He made paradise. And paradise does not include work. You just go and the food's there on the tree and you just eat and you stroll around and you have a great time. The work got introduced as a part of the fall. Isn't that right? 
That conception, that misconception has continued to permeate deep down in the substrata of the culture and, and to percolate up every once in a while. But the fact of the matter is, is that work is good. God is a worker. Very opening pages of the Bible reveal to us, describe for us, how God gets to work. He gets to work creating the heavens and the earth, creating all that there is. He labors for six days, and then he rests, and he makes us in his image. And because God is a worker, we are workers. God has called us to work. Work is a good thing. We were made to work the garden. God gave responsibility to Adam and Eve. Yes, the the tree of life would be there. You can eat from the trees of the garden. All the the fruit yielding and the vegetable yielding uh, plants, you may eat from them. But you're still going to have to work. You have to tend the garden. You have to provide oversight for the garden. Security for the garden. There's work to be done. God is a worker. We're workers. The fall caused Not the creation of work, but it caused resistance to our work. And resistance to the work of God. The created order is now filled with resistance. It fights us. It fights the things that God has has, uh, ordained. It fights what God uh, intends. The whole world has been plunged into a curse. And it is moaning and groaning in resistance Waiting for the revelation of the children of God. Resistance is a part of the fall. And now through the sweat of our brow, the world, the created order will yield its fruitfulness. If there are no theological commitments in the culture, there's still a problematic cosmology. Looking at the world and saying it's broken. The utopia that we all want and we all desire has not yet been realized. We all have to labor. We all have to work. Some will even say that work is an evil because it's a sign of injustice. Work is a matter of injustice. In April of 2020, just a little uh, close to two years ago, a prominent member of Congress argued that many Americans should protest economic insecurity by refusing to work once the coronavirus-related restrictions were lifted. After the 15 days to slow the spread were lifted, after all of the restrictions were lifted, and you can go back to work, it was suggested, don't do that. Resist that. It's unjust. This prominent member of Congress said the following, quote, When we talk about the idea of reopening society, only in America does the president, when the president speaks about liberation, does he mean go back to work? When we have this discussion about going back or reopening, I think a lot of people should just say, no. We're not going back to that. We're not going back to working 70-hour weeks just so that we can put food on the table, not even feel any sort of semblance of security in our lives. Don't work. Work becomes evil because it is a part of a larger problem of insecurity, inequity, economic injustice. It is part of a broken system which is part of the brokenness of this world. Work is evil. Stay away from it. We've allowed the world to set the agenda. The church sometimes wonders if work is evil too. If not evil, then at the very least immoral. Work is immoral. There are those who occupy the city of man who say that work is immoral. It's immoral because it includes a measure of labor. It includes a measure of stress. It includes a measure of sweat. It includes a measure of suffering. You build calluses on your hand. Your body aches. And because of all of that, because of the stress, because of the suffering, 
It's immoral. And our culture today is actively instilling a perception that this kind of stress should be avoided. It's not good. Avoid the stress. We see it in our therapeutic culture. And we see it being instilled mightily within our children. Greg Lukanoff and Jonathan Haidt have written a wonderful book. I commend it to your reading. It was published in 2018, entitled The Coddling of the American Mind. How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. It masterfully identifies this cultural problem whereby we are trying to spare our children from enduring any kind of stress, any kind of hard work. They are concerned or considered fragile. But Haidt and Lukanoff say that children are actually anti fragile and they need the stress. Let me share with you just a few insights from the book. Quote, we must look beyond the overused word resilience and recognize that some things are anti-fragile. And with that, they will include children. Children are actually designed to be anti-fragile. And if we don't get, let them experience a certain amount of stress, bad things actually happen. They go on to say, quote, many of the important systems in our economic and political life are like our immune system." They require stressors and challenges in order to learn, to adapt, to grow. Systems that are anti-fragile become rigid and weak and inefficient when nothing challenges them or pushes them to respond vigorously. Just as spending a month in bed leads to muscle atrophy, complex systems are weakened, even killed when deprived of stressors. Much of our modern world... Uh, much of our modern structures has been harming us with top-down policies and contraptions which do precisely this, an insult to the anti-fragility of systems. This is the tragedy of modernity. And then finally, quote, there's an old saying, prepare the child for the road, not the road for the child. But these days, we seem to be doing precisely the opposite. We're trying to clear away anything that might upset children. If we protect children from various classes of potentially upsetting experiences, we make it far more likely that those children will be unable to cope with such events when they leave our protective umbrella. Work is immoral, it's stressful, it's hard, it hurts. Therefore, we must protect. Little do we realize that we are sowing the seeds of our own demise and the demise of our culture. Because we've allowed the culture to define for us what work is. Work is evil. Work is immoral. But lastly, there are those many who occupy the city of man who simply say, come work for me. Come work for me. I'll give you bread. Come work for me. But what we don't realize is that we find ourselves working for Pharaoh. The land of Egypt. And the land of slavery. And so we come to our text this morning... And we hear what God has to say about work. If we were to summarize our text for this morning, I would summarize it in this way. Work is a good thing. It's created by God. God's a worker. And we are made in his image. Work is a good thing. But it becomes toil when our labor is directed. When our labor is devoted to the city of man and not the city of God. God has called us to be a worker. And he's not setting us free from, he's not eliminating for us labor. 
Labor is a part of what God has called us to do and to be laborers and co-laborers with him as those who have been given responsibility upon the earth. He's called us to be workers and laborers, but he wants our work and our labor to be directed and to be devoted to him and to his purposes and for his glory. And when we devote that to other things, lesser goods, objects, and idols, that are not worthy of our work, and we enter into problems, the work turns sour. It becomes toil. Work, labor, toil. All three of these are referenced in our text for this morning. I want to take just a moment to define these for you as they are understood in our text and as they are understood within the scriptures as a whole. The first is work. We've already said that work is a good thing. Work is both creational and moral. It has a creational dimension and a moral component. There's an ethical dimension and a developmental dimension to work. Creational first, the word work occurs with tremendous frequency within the Bible, particularly within Genesis and the Genesis account of creation, which is God's first great act in history. If the Bible is God's recorded history, what is the first thing we see God doing? We see him working. He creates. He creates all that there is. And he's called us to be co-creators. Not ex nihilo, not out of nothing, but to take the things that God has established and placed in this world and to see them refined and developed and made beautiful. To create. To create beauty and dignity and glory. That's what it means to be a worker. It's a good thing. But it's also ethical. Aside from the numerous accounts and occurrences of the word work, which means to do or to make, in a general sense, work is often used in an ethical sense to refer to ethical obligations. The covenant people of God were frequently commanded to do what? That which God commanded them to do. To work is to obey. To be a worker is to be obedient unto God. It is faith that leads to work. Work is an ethical response to God. Beyond the mere mental abstraction to say, yeah, I think I believe the Bible. I believe what it says. But then God says, go do it. Don't talk about it. Be about it. Live your life in such a way. Do the works of God which you have been commanded. Work makes obedience physical and evident for all to see. When we work, we demonstrate our loyalty and our obedience to God. When Israel is working and making bricks and building a city, they're doing a good thing. They're commanding, or they're, uh, they're fulfilling the commandment that God gave, which is to fill the earth and to subdue it. To refine the world, to build and to make things in the world. And so they're working and they're laboring. As they're doing the work, they're actually exerting effort, which is a good thing. Sweat is a good thing. The word labor literally means to press or to squeeze. And you can get the sense that the labor that the, uh, the, the uh, Israelite children were engaging in, the people of God, they were sweating as they did it. And that's a good thing. It's okay to get sweat and sweaty and to build sweat equity. It is to press or to squeeze the sweat out of something or someone. It also has a reference, I think, an allusion to the actual work that Israel was doing. They were pressing or squeezing the raw material into the molds in order to make the brick. And what does that suggest? It suggests that labor is formational. Labor is the exertion of effort, the pressing or the squeezing through work that actually forms us 
it forms the bricks, but it also makes us. It forms us in a particular way. We cannot become formed in God and formed in Christ without labor. God, just give me the money. Just plop it down. Let me see it rise in my bank account. I've given you hours. Go to work and become what I've called you to be. Be shaped, be formed. Our labor shapes us. It's formational, but it can shape us for good or shape us for ill. Labor offered to God shapes us in one particular way, but labor offered to Pharaoh will shape us in another way entirely. Labor that is directed to Pharaoh in an attempt to build Egypt always results in toil. Let me say that again. Labor that is directed to Pharaoh in an attempt to build Egypt always results in toil. And toil, as defined by our text, is the bearing of heavy burdens. It is the submission to forced labor in the false hope that we might actually achieve some measure of security. Toil is the submission to forced labor that the world exerts over us in this vain hope that we might, through our toil, actually find in ourselves and in our own work salvation. But we will never find salvation through toil. Pharaoh wants us to work and to labor for him, to toil for Egypt. And the only security that comes with it is the security that is found in enslavement. It is a slave security. Devoid of love, devoid of growth, devoid of well-being. But we labor for it. How many of us have done that? Working for Pharaoh, working for Egypt, because we think therein we'll find a measure of security. We think therein we'll find a measure of hope for the future. We think therein we will be safe. We will be saved. But we find ourselves in chains instead. We find our bodies broken instead find ourselves filled not with security but with insecurity God wants us to work for him and to direct our labor toward him in order to to produce a kingdom of worship and so the question is who do we work for who are we working for God's program is to build a holy city God's program is to build the church that is free from Egyptian slavery, free from sin, free from toil, in order that we might enter into the work of worship and liturgy and formation, work and worship and discipleship and fellowship and stewardship and mission and be made glorious Formed and fashioned in the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, God wants us to be free to bring our work and our labor back to the kingdom, to direct it to him and to the holy city in order to build something good and glorious for his namesake and for the healing and security of the nations. And that can only happen if we direct and devote our work and our labor to God. Pharaoh's program, the city of man's program, is slavery, idols, toil. And Egypt will not let us go so easily. When Pharaoh was commanded by God to release Israel, Pharaoh resisted. 
And in response, he increased the toil over Israel because he would not let them go. There will always be resistance. There will always be resistance to the building of the holy city. You have to suffer for it. Will you suffer for it? The question is, when the suffering starts, who will you turn to? Israel was in pain. And the people cried out, and God heard their cry. And because he heard their cry, he raised up Moses and he said to Moses, I'm going to send you to Egypt and I'm going to cause you to be a great deliverer. I'm going to set my people free because they are workers and I've called them to build, not the city of Egypt, not the, not the nation of Egypt, but to build my kingdom, to build my holy city. And so I'm going to send you down in order to set them free. But when God began to set the people of God free, the world, Egypt, Pharaoh, resisted. And what did Israel do in response to that resistance? They went back to the very source of their oppression and said, hey, can't you help us out? They didn't turn to God. They turned to Pharaoh. Remember what the text said, Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, why do you treat your servants like this? Look closely at the text, Israel is identifying itself with Egypt. They'd been given the promise. They had the patriarchs, they had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they had the promise that God had given to them, but they said, we are your servants, Pharaoh. We are your servants, Egypt. We work for you. Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are beaten. But the fault is in your own people. It's your fault, Pharaoh. How many times have we sought to seek the building of the kingdom of God, and resistance comes, and we go to the very oppressors and say, can you give us relief? Can't you make some kind of policy? Can't you pass some kind of law to give us relief? God is saying, why aren't you coming to me? They're only going to offer you more labor, more toil. I will set you free. It is Stockholm Syndrome at the highest level. Israel's identity was in Egypt. They cried out to Pharaoh and not to the Lord. They looked to Pharaoh for salvation. When things got tough, they looked to Pharaoh. Pharaoh might take away the straw, but God supplies strength. God supplies deliverance by a mighty hand. God supplies wealth as Israel plundered the Egyptians on their way out. God provides the spirit that falls upon men and women in order that they might have skill, in order that they might have ability to build the tabernacle, to build the city of God. Why do we keep looking to Pharaoh? Why do we keep looking to Egypt? Are we the church prepared to work for the benefit of the holy city? To direct our labors and efforts to the kingdom of God and to the great ends of the church? To worship, discipleship, fellowship, stewardship, mission? Are we willing to suffer for it? To work for it? To labor for it? And to direct it all to God? Christ suffered for it. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said. This wonderful summary statement in Hebrews chapter 13. Jesus suffered outside of the city. 
Jesus suffered outside of the gate, outside of the city of man, in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp. Let us leave the city of man and go where Christ is and bear the reproach that he endured. For we, for here we have no lasting city. There is no future. There is no hope in the city of man. For here we have no lasting city. But we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Sacrifices, suffering, labor, work. You've heard it said here at Beverly Heights Church that the church exists 100% of the time. 97% of the time, we are not in this place. We're scattered. And 3% of the time, we come here. Out of the seven 24-hour days of the week, that amounts to five hours. Five hours. Rick Wooling did all the math and statistics on this as part of his doctoral dissertation. On average, we roughly spend five hours in this place, devoting ourselves to worship, discipleship, fellowship, stewardship, mission. But God is offering us more hours. He says, I have work to do. I'm calling you to it. And I'm offering you more hours. What will our response be? Just give me the money. Or I thank God that he's given me more hours. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great work that you have done. The work that has been offered in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The great work of redemption and salvation. The great work of establishing your kingdom on earth. The great work upon which you laid a foundation and you have called us to build. To build with precious things, gold, silver, precious gems and stone. We're always getting a job offer. Egypt is always saying, come work for me. We're often tempted to say yes, but you have called us to devote our work and our labor to you. We know, Lord, we have responsibilities to our family, to our children, to our community. We have to earn money. We have to make a living. We want to do all those things, but we want to devote our work our labor to you and to the building of your church for the healing of the nations, even Egypt, even here, even now. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us as we sing. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more for him now to
God, what a world of peace and be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no man evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all men and women. Love and serve the Lord. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you. Today, tomorrow, until Jesus comes again. And then indeed it shall be forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. There is nothing greater than the people of God joining together for worship on the Lord's Day. We're so very glad that you have been with us this morning on our live stream. We started our live stream ministry a number of years ago to serve those who could not be with us in residential worship. Here at Beverly Heights Church, we place a high value on worship. We believe that God has called us to gather by his love for us each and every Lord's Day. If you are close to us here in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to personally welcome you and invite you to come and join with us in residential worship if you find yourself able. For those of you who may be joining us this morning who are not in the greater Pittsburgh region, I want to encourage you to consider finding a local church where you can worship on the Lord's Day. You could even consider going to the EPC's website where they have a church locator to help you find a local church home. God bless.